So far in this series of talks, we've said a bit about the basics of vibration and sound, and we've said a little bit about these musical instruments that you see in the background here, in that we've looked at their vibration modes. Now in this instalment, we're going to look at a different way of characterising the vibration behaviour, something called frequency response. You'll find out what that is in a moment. So, here's our instrument collection, but we won't begin with real instruments. We'll start by thinking about a single vibration mode, like the vibrating ruler that we saw right back in the first talk. Now, this graph here shows the response of a single uh, resonator, such as a tuning fork, if you just hit it or pluck it and let it ring on. And it, it's just something called a sine wave. It's a periodic waveform, repeats and goes on forever. Well, real systems never do that. They don't go on forever. There's always some uh, source of energy dissipation if nothing else, uh, some of the energy in the vibration goes to make sound and that's radiated off as sound waves in the air and carries some energy off with it. So all real systems will decay and here are three different possibilities for slow, medium and fast decay. And we associate this with a property called damping nothing to do with being wet. It describes the rate of energy dissipation. You can characterise damping in various ways. One way that's often used in musical instruments is something called the Q factor. Uh, it's a, a terminology that comes from the world of quartz crystals back in the days when radio sets, for example, used quartz crystals to provide their frequency reference for the tuning. Well, a high quality oscillator, quartz oscillator, had very low damping uh, for reasons that we'll see in a moment. And so this Q factor, quality factor, large values go with low damping. So this red curve for the undamped oscillator, well, the Q factor for that would actually be infinite. The other three curves here have finite values of the Q and I've just plotted what the response looks like with three particular numbers. Q equals 100 for the black one, 30 for the blue one, 10 for the green one. And there's an easy way that you can visualize what this number means. The Q factor tells you how many cycles you need for the amplitude to decay down by a certain factor. If we count 10 cycles of the green waveform, you can see roughly what that reduction is. So the green one, the Q of 10, gets down to this small value in, um, in the range that we've plotted. But the blue one and the black one take too long. They would get there eventually. The blue one would need 30 cycles to get to the same amplitude. The black one would need 100 cycles to get to the same amplitude. So out to the right hand side of the plot. So that's the time response of these oscillators with various levels of damping. Now we're going to introduce this idea of frequency response. Now, underlying everything else I'm going to say in this talk, there is some mathematics which I'm not going to tell you about or show you, but it does mean you have to believe some things that I will pluck out of the air in the remainder of this talk. So the idea of frequency response is that we say, OK, we're not interested in this free response of our single vibration mode, for example. Um, I want to know the how it responds when I apply a force to it. So what we think of is that we take our oscillator, a tuning fork perhaps, or whatever it might be that's doing this single, um, single mode, single resonance here. We apply a force to it, which is a sine wave. And we 
see how the oscillator responds as we vary the frequency of this sine wave force. And the amplitude of the oscillation is, as a function of frequency, is our frequency response function. Now, I've plotted it on the left hand side for the same four cases of this oscillator that, uh, that you see on the right hand side. What you can see is that they all have a peak at the resonant frequency. I've drawn the frequency axis in terms of a ratio to the resonant frequency of the oscillator itself. So if you drive it right at its resonance, well, of course, you get um, the largest response. So you get a peak there. But it doesn't only respond at that frequency. You force it at a frequency that's a little higher or a little lower, and it will still vibrate. It'll just vibrate less. And they will add up. If, you, if we scan across frequency with our excitation force, it will mark out these various curves here. And what we see is that the different levels of damping, going with the different colours of curves, change the shape of this curve here. Now, we start with the undamped one, the red curve, and that doesn't stop at the top of the plot that I've done here. That would, in theory, mathematical theory, go off to infinity. And really, that's what you'd expect. If you've got an oscillator with no energy dissipation and you force it right at its resonant frequency, you keep feeding energy into it and it never loses any any of it so the energy just grows and grows and grows and grows and in theory uh, not in the real world the amplitude would actually be infinite so an undamped oscillator has an infinitely high peak response but as soon as we've got some damping that doesn't happen eventually we find a balance where the energy we're feeding in with our force is balanced by the energy that's being dissipated by the damping process. And you can see that the curves are in the same order on the left hand side that they are on the right hand side. The higher the damping, the green one has the highest damping, the lower is the peak response. And the blue one is a bit higher, and the black one is a bit higher than that. And the red one, as I say, is, goes all the way off to infinity in theory. We see something else by looking at that set of curves. We can see that at very low frequency, they all lie on top of each other. You can't see the four separate curves. So what we deduce from that is changing the damping down at these low frequencies makes no difference to the frequency response. Something similar happens at the high frequencies when we're out here on the right. Again, the curves are all on top of each other and the damping doesn't make any difference. But in the middle, that's where we get obviously different heights of the peak. So we can deduce what is governing the behaviour. At very low frequency, well below the resonance frequency, our motion is simply dominated by the stiffness, by the restoring force of our mode. The inertia, the mass, isn't really making any difference. At high frequency, it's the other way around. We're above the resonance. Now the stiffness, the restoring force, hardly matters. And we're dominated by the mass. And in the end, all these curves are following the result that would just be the mass, even if it didn't have a restoring force. In the middle, the response level is very suddenly very sensitive to the damping. And so we've got these three regions that are dominated by stiffness and then damping and then mass. That was one mode. Suppose we have two modes. Here they are separately. These are simply two copies of the same kind of curve we saw in the last slide. But these are two modes of the same system. So actually, the forced response will involve adding these things together. Well, there are two different things that might happen then. It all depends whether they're added together 
or actually they're subtracted. In other words, when we combine them in our vibration recipe, remember that those drum animations a couple of talks ago? When we combine them in the in that recipe, they might combine with a positive sign or they might combine with a negative sign. And that gives two different results. The two black curves were the two separate things. When we add them together with uh, with or without a plus sign or a minus sign. If we add them together with a plus sign, we get the red curve with a deep dip in between called an anti-resonance. If we add them together with a minus sign, we get the blue curve. So we get a shallow valley rather than this really deep dip here. So there are two kinds of things that might happen in between the two peaks uh, when we combine, when we have two modes operating together right at the peak they all look the same uh, near each peak separately the combined response is dominated by whichever of these two modes is resonating but in between there are two different behaviors that will become important in due course okay so how do we measure the frequency response of an actual instrument the way I described it is that we apply a force to it, which is a sine wave, and then we gradually change the frequency of that sine wave and we measure the response. People used to do the measurements that way, but it's actually rather a pain uh, because for a start you need to attach some kind of excitation device to your instrument to apply your sine wave. But there's another way to do it, and this is where we leverage a mathematical result which I'm just going to pluck out of the air. This is something called frequency analysis or Fourier analysis. And what this says is that you don't actually have to apply a sine wave. You can apply any force you like, provided you can measure it. You then grab that force into your computer and you do something called an FFT, which you might have heard of the FFT, it stands for Fast Fourier Transform. And what that does is that it takes the waveform of the force you've applied and it turns it into a kind of recipe of sine waves. Fourier, a French mathematician, found that you can any waveform whatsoever can be expressed as a combination of sine waves at different frequencies. And this computer routine called the FFT allows you to do that. So here's the typical way that we would do measurements these ways what we're hitting we're hitting the bridge of our violin here or a banjo over here with a little tiny hammer and you can see that there's a wire coming out of the hammer that's because it has a little force measuring sensor built into it so we can observe the waveform of the force when the hammer bounces off the bridge of the instrument for example that'll be a kind of pulse so we grab that into our computer and we also record the response with some kind of sensor. There are various things we could use. Um, these pictures are actually using something called a laser vibrometer. You can just about see a bright red spot there and more clearly you can see a bright red spot here on the banjo. Um, that's a laboratory method but they're rather expensive. Uh, when these things are done in instrument makers workshops they usually use a something called an accelerometer, which is a tiny thing, less than a gram, um, which you stick onto the instrument and that measures the, the motion in response to the hammer blow here. So we, are, we tap it with our hammer, we measure the force pulse, we measure the response with whatever sensor we're using. We swallow both of those into our computer we do this magic thing with the FFT and that expresses both the force and the output and the response of the instrument as a recipe of sine waves at different frequencies. Now we can frequency by frequency we can take the response and we can divide it by the amplitude of the force and that gives us in one fell swoop the frequency response that we wanted because we've expressed the input as a mixture of sine waves via Fourier analysis. We've actually applied them all at once in our hammer tap but that doesn't matter. 
That's where the mathematical magic comes in. So we've got a recipe of sine waves for the input. We've got the corresponding recipe of sine waves for the output. We divide one by the other and you get something like this. This is the typical frequency response of a violin as a function of frequency. And you see you get this very jagged curve full of peaks. Those have something to do with the vibration modes of the instrument, but we'll talk about those in the next talk. This is just a tantalising taster of what we get from these measurements. All these frequency response plots I've been showing on decibel plots uh, because the range of response is very large. So if we plot it just as a linear scale of amplitude, all the interesting stuff gets lost because you, all you can see is the high peaks and these, these deep valleys are not really discriminated. This is a kind of scale like, like the frequency scale, which we're also using here, which is this thing called a logarithmic scale, which where constant intervals along the axis correspond to constant ratios rather than uh, constant factors. And the definition of decibels in this context is that 20 decibels, for example, the range I've shown in this green arrow here, corresponds to a factor of 10 in amplitude. This plot shows 60 decibels on the vertical scale, so the whole range there corresponds to three factors of 10, so a factor of a thousand in amplitude. That's as much as we're going to say. We'll look at uh, what those results mean in the next talk. Let me now sum up what we've learned this time. So we've learned, or at least I have told you and you have to believe, <laughs> that provided the vibration amplitude is small, then we can leverage this mathematical result called Fourier analysis or frequency analysis. How do we know it's small enough? Well, for instrument bodies, it generally is. The, we're not talking about the string vibration here. The vibration of the body of an instrument is less than a millimeter, usually a lot less than that. So small, this assumption of small vibration is generally okay. We looked at the frequency response function of a single vibration mode, and we found that that gave a single peak at its resonant frequency. We then found that the height and the width of the peak depended on the damping. And then I showed you, in the sense of pulling a rabbit out of a hat, I showed you what a measurement might look like for getting the frequency response of an instrument. And these were the three stages. I said you could apply any force you like provided you can measure it. And we used a little miniature hammer in the example I showed. So you measure that force, you measure the response, you convert both of them into these frequency recipes using this thing called the FFT, and then you get your computer to divide the output by the input frequency by frequency, and that gives you this frequency response function that we want. And the remarkable thing, which depends on this invisible mathematics, is that you should get exactly the same result whatever force you apply. So this frequency response gives a kind of vibration fingerprint of that particular instrument body. What those fingerprints mean, we'll start to look at in the next talk in the series.